Uh, you brought with you uh, somebody from the office this morning. I Bill did. Kearns. I had to. I had to beg her to come in, but um, she um, came very gracefully this morning and got behind a couple school buses. But she made it <laughs> oh, here on graceful. time. And uh, Kara Harding's our environmental health chief, and uh, she accepted the offer to come and be able to speak today on some environmental health issues. So I'm glad she joined us. Yes. Good morning, Kara. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Mm, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Kara, well, Kara's here. I always get we the feel. I always get the feeling like she's sitting there, but she's like this. <laughs> just stay at a good distance. Isn't that why you moved her closer to you this yeah, morning? Just to breed a little more uncomfortableness <laughs> out of Kara in the morning, because I just like to watch her squirm over there, because she just loves these TV appearances so much. I yeah. miss when it was just radio. Yeah. <laughs> Sort of like some of the rest of us that have a face for radio. A hundred percent. You don't choose these careers accidentally. And then Mr. Hornby had to go into the TV business. And stick it right there. <laughs> right there. Right there. Right. Well, Kara, here we are, ready to say goodbye to winter of 2023. We're going to get into spring of 2023. It's not that far from now that we will be opening swimming pools, getting into all kind of public health stuff in the summer months. And what a last three years it's been with that. And Correct. I wonder, maybe you can tell me, uh, are we 100% back to normal with those things as you anticipate this upcoming uh, better uh, better uh, weather season? Definitely. Uh, I think we're back to normal as normal can be. Uh, but as far as all of our programs, we're out doing everything at the normal frequency that we were prior to COVID. Uh, the only issue now is I'm um, down a staff, so um, we are hiring um, for a sanitarian position. You looked at me. Um, I, it's are you depend, interested? It's going to be depending on the starting <laughs> salary. <laughs> well, <laughs> we, it's not too bad um, here in Berkeley County. Um, you know, we do have a special hiring rate for sanitarian. Nice. Um, yeah, so hopefully that will help get us um, some experienced individuals. Uh, but the problem is it takes so long to train someone. It's uh, about a year of training before they can actually be fully, you know, out and on their own. So, what does a sanitarium do? Uh, about 20-plus programs. Um, so we're talking about pools. But as you know, uh, food, daycares, uh, food festivals like the food trucks, uh, goodness, Tattoo parlors. Oh, tattoo parlors. Complaint investigations, which we've received lots of those. We do septic and well, of course. So there's a lot of yeah. different stuff you have oh, to do. Oh, there learn. is. Um, animal bites, so we deal with rabies program. Uh, but like I said, I always leave out uh, one or two. But it, it's a lot of information that they have to retain. And the more years that you do it, I mean, I still learn things all the time. And I've been doing public health for about 20 years, so... It's it's always a learning experience, and there's something that you think you know, and um, you know you discover something new. But you know, like I said, I, I think that uh, as far as the restaurants, we've been out and about. Um, unfortunately, we've ran into some problems, but you know, like I said, people get out of practice when they don't see the health department for the two years that we were involved with disease investigation. So um, we're trying to get everybody back in the shape as easily as we can. So, as you let's talk about the restaurants. What kind of things are you encountering at restaurants, and and are you having to cite more than you might normally have had to cite had we not had the COVID situation? I think it's definitely affected it because uh, some places that you know we're going into we're writing you know anywhere f from two pages to six pages, and prior and, and that to means violations. Violations. Yeah. yeah so. I uh, definitely think that, you know, also with the sh the staff shortages, it's hard to stay up on the cleaning and everything. So I think they've kind of let that go because they're just trying to survive uh, just to, you know, be able to make do with the staff they have. And so when you're short, it's kind of hard to stay up on the cleaning part. And then it just kind of snowballs and until you actually take the time and, you know, make that about what you're doing. Um, I think that's pretty much what the the issue is is the staff shortage and of course i think that's related to covid bill does that make you think twice about going out to eat for your usual breakfast <laughs> uh no not really because i realize this uh the health department does a marvelous job with sanitarian checking what would constitute 
what level of concern would constitute shutting the restaurant down? So uh, West Virginia is very strong with the federal food code. We go by the 2013 food code. I know you're thinking, oh, my gosh, that's nine years past. But that is uh, what we adopted. And it, uh, West Virginia only allows what we call three priority violations to not be immediately correctable. And priority means ones that could initially, you know, could make someone sick. So if we're in a place and we're, you know, 10, 15, we've seen more, 20, 30. And if the management's not making any initi initiative to actually um, correct anything, that warrants a closure. Of course, if there's things that are uh, um, um, imminent health hazard, like no hot water, no water, uh, sewage coming back into the restaurant. Uh, that, that would be a know, big one. It would be <laughs> yes. a big one. <laughs> That's um, one right there. Eh, tough to get by that one. Hey, just work around it. <laughs> mm. No, thank you. But, yeah. you know, so those type of things. And we try to have as much leniency as we can because we know we haven't sure. been there. But we still owe it to the public to do the right thing to make sure that it's safe for them to eat at um, when they when they go out. Is sewage it, backing up into the restaurant a problem you encounter a lot of? Please tell me this is rare. It's rare. Thank you. Right. But when it happens, <laughs> it happens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's a it's a cliche to be sure, but it's uh, but we depend upon you folks, and uh, we very much appreciate what you do. Well, thank you. There's a lot of uh, in the news recently, quite a bit on forever chemicals. Uh, do you address for the this category of forever chemicals, or is it too early in the process uh, to identify them? And uh, I'm not familiar it? with that. Okay. I am not. Okay. They're, they're, you want to try? No, no. no. Well, you, you're the pro, I'm not. But, no, but anyway, the, the chemicals that are uh, generally uh, small concentration, but they will stay in the, in the body and the system mm -hmm. for forever. And if you get a certain, certain threshold, then you could have some, some problems, cancers, oh, in general, wow. the product. There's, uh, the EPA is looking at it, but I, they've also been looking at it for several years and trying to get a handle on just what does it mean and what are thresholds. But I get the impression there's more visibility directed toward them now, so something you'll probably be looking at in the near future. We always address chemicals, and, and honestly, that is quite a problem mm -hmm. uh, with storage and where people want to place those things. So we do always address that in our inspections. You know, they want to put chemicals even on top of the dishwasher mm -hmm. or in prep areas. Uh, there has to be that separation. So we look at it. We don't look at it, uh, you know, directly related to that. But that is a, a common violation, um, misstorage of chemicals. Okay, yeah. This would be a different type of chemicals. But never. Uh, you mentioned a lot of things that sanitarians do. Uh, uh, how many do you have on staff? Uh, right now I have uh, three fully fledged sanitarians in uh, Berkeley and I have uh, one in training and then I have a sanitarian in uh, Berkeley or Berkeley Springs Morgan County. A, that's in, it. <laughs> yeah, in an ideal world, with you said you had twenty different areas that you looked at, uh, and you and the ones you mentioned are pretty significant areas to uh, to address or to monitor. In the ideal world, how many sanitarians in Berkeley County would you need? I feel that we could probably, uh, you know, it, it was great when we had five, but I know in in some counties in in the state because we're we're growing as fast as you know Charleston and Morgantown. Uh, they have as many as eight or nine, and sometimes they're specific, you know, to a certain program. But definitely with over 600 permitted food establishments and getting that frequency in there every six months, it's a definite need to have, uh, you know, at least a few more individuals. <laughs> do, do we have as many homes on water and septic as what we did before on an absolute scale? I realize a lot of homes are in subdivisions with public water, public uh, sewer, but by the same token, we're growing so much, and a lot of people are growing outside of these uh, of the right. uh, subdivisions. There we're, is still still a, a yeah. still a lot of well yeah. and septic. Uh, septic is, you know, of course, food is probably the largest, followed by septic, because uh, it's just hard for them to keep up with them because they, they roll in uh, constantly. And generally, one sanitarian designates the whole entire uh, two weeks they're on that particular program to just do that specifically. 
and they stay quite busy um, going all over the entire county because especially also in Morgan, there's a, a lot of uh, county and area to cover. Yeah. We mentioned radon on a daily uh, basis here. How big a problem is radon? Well, now that we have our radon grant back, which Bill can talk more about that. Thank you, Delegate John Hardy. <laughs> yes, I was going to give him yes, credit there. Yes, um, we're going to be uh, seeing it more. Of course, the years that we didn't have it, um, we weren't seeing those specific numbers. But now that uh, we're giving out the test kits and going to, you know, be at the home show and different things like that, and once the numbers start coming in, I mean, it's been there all along. Uh, we just... Um, aren't we hadn't been seeing those numbers and uh definitely it will we'll be seeing those 20 30s and i think you know we had some eight 80s um and anything over four is considered significant and i that's how i discovered radon in my own home when i we purchased it um back then it was 2008 in 2009, I believe, they didn't really recognize radon as much as part uh, on a home sale. And I said, do you mind if I just, you know, hang one of our test kits? Because we had it back then and uh, was able to discover at that time it was eight in our unfinished basement. And um, it didn't make any difference in the, the sale of the house. There was no yeah. stipulation written in there. But now I believe um that it can be a stipulation on a sale of a house. Um, but back then it wasn't. I just knew it was something that I needed to get mitigated. Well, it's associated with the limestone rock we have Correct. here. So you're going, everybody's going to have ra Correct. some radon. What's the consequence of a, of, let me, two questions, I guess. What is the threshold of radon that you, we should be nervous about? And once it reaches that threshold, what is the consequence of the radon? So as I said, anything over four, and what is the measurement again? Piker Curies. Thank you. Didn't want to screw that one up. <laughs> um, so would be a good name for a minor league baseball team. <laughs> it would be. The Piker Curies. Anything over four is of concern. Okay. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, and it's, it's strange because, for instance, my house had eight, my neighbor had nothing, and the home on the other side had 80. Whoa. Mm. Yeah, so, so it's very random. It, it is very random, but what it comes down to is your foundation yes. um, and how well that was built. Um, and so that, of course, creates the, the venue for it to get into your home. And I did indeed have a pretty significant crack in my basement floor, and we sealed it. And uh, it did help somewhat, but um, it didn't correct it. And uh, actually, later we tested it, um, and it was uh i believe it was 12 at that point in time so um, we did have to put on uh one of the uh fans the radon fans mm -hmm. on our passive system that was already on our home and what's what are the consequences what is it lung cancer oh, okay. um it's what second it's the second cigarettes it, it's the second leading cause of lung cancer um if you get a level in at your house um around four that's equivalent to smoking a pack of cigarettes a day of exposure there um and the the levels in our areas because of the karst geology you spoke about um the the soils anytime you're disturbing soils you have a chance of creating that fissure where the radon levels can or the radon gases can come up because you're not going to know it's in your house it's odorless it's tasteless you can't smell it um, but it can get up in your house and sometimes there you, you think your home is newly built and it and it's um sealed well but it's not necessary. There's yeah. always inlets coming into your house, especially even people don't think about it. Your your um, wells or your septics, you have inlets coming into your house. Um, so you can have outlets going out of your house. Um, but um, the the chances of getting that are, are strong. It's actually more, more prevalent in newer homes to see um, higher radon levels than it is ho older homes. Because they've been degassed over the time. Yeah. Older homes yeah. are more drafty. Yeah. They are. They have a opportunity for the gas to escape. Um, yeah. We tell people to, to to put your test kits when you get them into the lowest living level of your house that you spend most of your time. Radon's not dangerous in small um, doses, but if you spend a majority of your time there, you're going to want to 
put it down in the lowest living level. That's where it's going to come in. It's going to be most concentrated. But with the karst geology that we have in Berkeley County, as well as Morgan, Jefferson, all around this area, it creates a, a great avenue for radon to get into your home. It's easy to take care of. Um, so we tell people, you know, homes that are built after the 80s are required to have a passive system. If you live in Berkeley County, it's in the code, the building code that they have to put that passive system in there. Doesn't mean that that's taking care of your radon. You can say, hey, I got this tube in my basement. It's got radon road on it going up there or up in my attic. That's not an active system. That's just a white tube. It's coming from the underneath the, in the substrate down into the gravel and the foundation. It's not active until you take a section out of that and, and insert an exhaust fan to create that draft to pull those gases out and expel it out the, out of your house. Um, but just because you have that in there doesn't mean you shouldn't have it tested annually, um, which is why we're so happy to be able to get this grant back that we can provide these. And Bill, you underwrite. I, I've heard you have underwrote that grant a couple times in the morning um, <laughs> yeah, right. uh, that Rob lets us know. Rob's volunteered. But, made that, but yes, he's such a generous yes. guy. Uh, yeah. Poor Larry Kump. He was, uh, he was nervous the other day when he was made yeah. aware of that. But, yes. yes. Um, but, the first uh, guest is always very generous, Bill. Yes. Uh, but uh, to have your house still tested every year to see if your levels, and they can change from year to year, season to season. Um, as your home's closed up during the wintertime, your levels are going to be a lot higher if you do have those levels in your house because the doors are shut, the windows are shut. Um, but have, have your home tested annually. Even if you've had a, a new house, have it tested. If you have an active system that's put in place, and you'll know because um, you'll have a little leveler um, with liquid level on there, and they'll show that there's a draft, and uh, you want to see if it's working and your radon levels are low, um, get a test kit. and So you can get those from the health department, and also we're going to be having them at the home show, so we're glad to be back this year, as Kara mentioned, um, by a lot of help down in Charleston to help get this grant back, and Delegate Hardy was very instrumental in making that happen. Happen. But, um, you know, even if you're quite sure that you have radon taken care of, you're never going to be sure until you have it tested. Yeah, we've been mentioning, Rob's been mentioning for quite a while about the, the uh, radon test kit. But until this morning, I did not have an appreciation of, of the value of them. One, cancer, lung cancer especially. But the point that you made, the comparison you made, Bill, for the first time I can identify with the impact where uh, uh, four microcuries equivalent to one, uh, one pack of cigarettes per day. That is something we can all relate to, a certain number of cigarettes. And then your neighbor with 80, mm -hmm. that equates to 20 uh, packs of cigarettes per day. That is something that we can identify with and the importance of the radon test kits. The uh, highest level, and I've been writing this grant since 1996, um, the highest gr uh, level that I've ever seen come back was almost 200. Oh my. Mm. Almost 200. Bill, quick, how many packs of cigarettes is that a day? <laughs> 50, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's active smoker there. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Bill and Kara, do you have an approved list of vendors for people to get radon uh, corrective work done at their homes? We, we can get that for you, and we'll have it at the home show um, that we can let them know that they're licensed by the state as far as a radon mitigator. Um, there's a number of them. and uh, Or you can go on the state's website, um, um, uh, environmental health website, and get those lists off there. But again, you know, stop by and see us at the home show. Um, we have a lot of information. We can give you educational radon and other programs that happen within the health department. And um, uh, great opportunity to stop by and just say hi. Are there scam operators out there that try to do work for people under the guise of being an approved licensed mitigator? And Always. Uh, and so be careful about that. Always. And, um, a, a great point, Rob. Uh, to mitigate mitigate a house, and I realize every house is different. The mitigation is going to be a, a different scale. But for a typical home, how much would it cost to mitigate a home? Um, the the mitigation is is quite 
quite simple. If the house has a passive system in there, it's 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 uh, very inexpensive um, to be able to take a section out of that pipe and insert the the, uh, the exhaust fan and wire it in there. You you may look at um, fifteen hundred dollars or less. Okay. Um, whereas if you have an older home, it needs to be retrofitted with the system. You you could look up to thirty five hundred to four thousand dollars. For but, retro, depending on how much is involved, they want to try to have at least a, the least amount of that system showing um, to you. So it maybe ran through a, a closet, um, up and vented out to your attic um, as much as possible. But it depends on how much construction is required. But compared to the potential damage you get from twenty to fifty packs of cigarettes a day, right. it's a uh, it's. Well, in our area, so many people have said, you know, I had, I, my, my spouse or my mother or father, somebody died of lung cancer, and they've never been a smoker. They don't live with people that are smoking, but yet they had lung cancer. Well, there's a good chance you may have had high radon levels in your house growing up and, and, and through an extended period of time has caused that damage. Well, and that's one of the questions we ask. Do you smoke in the home? And they kind of wonder, well, why are you asking me that? And, of course, if they're smoking in the home and they have those levels of radon, I mean, they're getting, you know, a, a double whammy. Is it likely that most homes in Berkeley County have some level of radon? Some level to an extent, yes. Um, it may be minor. It may be under one. Um, it, it's very minor. The systems do work. I, I gave this example so many times when, when we very on the onset of, of getting this grant, we looked at our old health department, and our levels came in, and, uh, and, and that was over on a, uh, at that time was 800 South Queen Street, now Emmett Roush, but um, the levels came in in the 30s. Um, the county commission was very proactive, um, and they put in a, a, a radon mitigation system they had had to retrofit it because there was not one in there and every time after that that we tested it, it came in under one what so year did, was that, Bill? Did it, I was I working there? You were not. Oh, good. You were probably still in school. <laughs> I was going to say I didn't hear that story. <laughs> you, you were probably still in school. Just okay. a <laughs> that was, I believe, ninety seven, somewhere around there. I was in college. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the, the test kits that you'll have at the home show, Bill. Yes. Well, th those, if I remember, they're fairly simple, and uh, they are. They just hang them, and there's like a what, like a spongy thing. Or yeah. Something? They're it, the sponge. The only purpose is to hold the test kit open so that the particles can attract to the carbon filter that's in there mm -hmm. um, but you hang it three to five days and at the end of that period you, you take it down you, you take that little sponge out and its life is done um, you, you seal that package up and pop it in the mail it's postage paid the results only come to you as the homeowner whatever you put on that paper as a whole um, the health department basically just gets back a level um, for that area um, but you will, will never contact the person that has the the test kits uh, if they have high levels they would need to contact us so we let them know we're not going to contact you this isn't somebody that's going to come in and try to condemn your house mm -hmm. because you have high radon levels it's completely confidential no it's not a marketing tool no one's going to call you um, you get those high levels back we want you to call us and we're basically going to tell you to test your we want to get your house tested again in about six months then if it comes back high again then we're going to want you to get in touch with a mitigator and we can give you that list um, but we're your public health department so we have nothing to gain except for keeping you safe now the radon test kits will be given out at the home show, mm -hmm. but except for the home show, they have to go, go to the health department to get a to get a kit. Or you can go to your home improvement store and purchase them um, through the grant. We purchase them, um, and um, so you can come to the health department in in Morgan County or at, at Berkeley County and let them know you know Rob Mario, and um, and you can get it absolutely free for tomorrow. <laughs> you get, whose name has been mentioned most at the health department over the months that, that they've been kindly, generously sponsoring this? Anybody? Has, has anybody come in and said, Bill Kearns, I just want to say that I know Bill Stubblefield. That gets me a free test kit. I don't know, but we've been giving out a good many, so maybe we're just not asking the right question. You should ask that question. That Yeah. yeah. They say, who do you know? Who do you know? Kara, before you go, anything else that you need to tell our audience? Uh, Other than how much you enjoy coming in for the show. I do enjoy coming in. <laughs> awesome. Um, I don't enjoy watching myself later when I look at the screen. <laughs> Um, but other than just as I mentioned, we are hiring. Um, I think the job uh, for a sanitarian closes 
soon. Uh, soon, this week. Do we know um, what the pay range is for It, it starts off right at $40,000. Mm-hmm. A requirement for that position is you do have to have a bachelor's degree. And we provide every bit of training that you need. And and it's a, a great working hours, except when you're having um, home shows and uh, and, uh, and fairs and festivals. But um, we uh, 830 to 430, Monday through Friday, is your work schedule. Federal and state holidays, great benefit package. And, and you get to work for an incredible environmental health chief. A, a bachelor's <laughs> degree in, in anything? <laughs> In English or yes, uh, anything, anything, because mm-hmm. we're going to pr- the state is going to provide all the training needed, and then yeah. after that, then we locally provide all the on the job training. Is this a statewide requirement? Yes. Kara, great to see you again. Thanks for having me.